I'd like to introduce Professor Gregory Lenius. I believe I pronounced his last name correctly. He'll come correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> He's from Brown University Public of Health, School of Public Health. How are you doing? Great, great to meet you. Thank Thanks you so much. I appreciate you coming in. So this actually research just came out and you kind of headed it all, correctly? Uh, yes, it was a group of us uh, based uh, at, at Brown University and uh, the Departments of Health of Maine, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. So it was a great team effort. This is, actually, I was going over all of it today, uh, just read as much as I could, but before we get started and really dive into what your findings were mm -hmm. and really what it means, to, just so we can get, because we're going to be talking a lot about the heat index, why don't you explain to people what the heat index means and what, because it's not just temperatures, it has to do with humidity and, right. and how things affect us. Why don't you explain right. that? Right, that's right. The heat index is trying to get at how hot it really feels outside. So it might only be 80 degrees outside, but if it's 80% uh, percent humidity, it might really feel more like a, a, a 95 degree day. So it doesn't need to be that hot, but it's that combination of heat and humidity that makes it feel really gross and sticky outside. And that's what we think is a good metric of, of really how hot you feel and how uncomfortable uh, and how much risk you might be at for heat related events. Okay, and we get, we get pretty difficult days here in New England. Um, so let's talk about this. What did you find and how, let's find, what did you find when you were doing this study? Right, so what we were looking at is that the National Weather Service typically issues heat advisories when they forecast that the heat index tomorrow is going to be uh, 100 degrees or, or greater. Now, that's not necessarily that hot a day. Again, it may be a 75 degree day with 80, per, or sorry, an 80 degree day with something like 80 degree, 80 percent humidity. Okay. And we were saying, well, is that really the right level? I mean, why, why 100? And so we started thinking, could we look in, in this region specifically, at what point do we start seeing more people going to the emergency room and more people dying from heat? And is that coincidence with the 100 degree heat index that the National Weather Service uses? And what we found is that it, it's not, that you actually see more people going to the emergency department and dying even on days that have a heat index below 100 degrees. So even on days where we don't have a heat advisory or heat warning, we still see this extra risk of related to heat. And you went in and looked at several different areas. So it wasn't just Rhode Island. You right. went into several different areas. Tell us a little bit about the research that you did going in and, and finding this information. Yeah, so we pooled forces with uh, New Hampshire and Maine because each one of our states was interested in asking the same question, but the population of each of these states is really too small to do it on our own. In order to really get uh, uh, the sufficient number of events happening uh, so that we can look at this, we really need uh, lots of data and Rhode Island with about a million people doesn't quite have enough to do it on its own. So it was a great collaborative effort across the three states that allowed us to draw these conclusions for the New England area. Yeah, I found it really interesting going into Providence area, went into New Hampshire, went mm -hmm. into Maine and really collecting all this data. And why did you think this was so important to do? Yeah, because we want the policy on the ground to reflect the what we think is the best science. And right now that, that policy the National Weather Service was acting on uh, uh, is, is great and uh, is protective for the population, but we thought, gosh, maybe there's even risk below those temperatures. And if we can do something to prevent some of those extra deaths and some of those extra hospital admissions, then that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so just looking at some of the data here, uh, let's see, so heat index of 75 days with heat index of 95 resulted in 7.5% more heat related emergency visits and 5.1% more heat related deaths over the following week. And then, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, so you, you took a baseline and then you saw more people visiting uh, the emergency room and then more deaths. So, uh, and let's see, then a heat index of 95 deaths were at 5.1 percent higher um, and then at 100 they were 9.4 percent higher so when you go in and you're looking at deaths mm -hmm. What information did you find? What could you really gather? So what gather? we really wanted to compare is, you know, so the 75 deg uh, degree day, those heat index days uh, are, are ones that, that nobody would really think are, are associated with Yeah, because uh, you think 75 risk. degrees is not yeah, bad. Yeah, then... you know, even with some humidity, that would be fine, right? So, so we took that as sort of the comparison point and then used these 95 degree heat index days or 100 degree heat index days to say, okay, where's, what's the extra risk now where the National Weather Service does issue heat advisory? 
advisories, and what is it at a level slightly lower than that, the 95 degrees. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, we found that 7% extra uh, emergency visits and 5% extra deaths uh, on those 95 degree days and, or heat index of 95 degrees. One of the interesting things is that we didn't see uh, all the effect just on the same day. So you think, oh, it's hot today, I have to be careful today. Yeah. But you actually, we saw that about more than half of the effect uh, on emergency visits was on the next couple days. So if you uh, uh, can imagine, you know, your behavior, you think, okay, it's really hot today, I'm gonna drink a lot of water, I'm gonna, you know, not go jogging, uh, I'll go tomorrow instead when it's a bit cooler, but you're, we're still seeing that excess risk on the next couple days. And so that really has, um, uh, provide some information for policy makers that want to say, okay, it's not just that we need to warn people or teach people about the risks on the day of, but how about the next day or two after that? That's Yeah, that's very interesting. So you were able to compile this data, and then you went to the National Weather Service and they made a change, right? Yeah, so the National Weather Service was uh, enthusiastically involved right from the beginning where they said, uh, you know, we're happy if you can provide us with better information for better policy, we're happy to look at that. And so they were involved in the discussion right from the beginning. And then when we had the results and we shared the final results with them, they said, yeah, that makes sense. What do you recommend? And we went back and forth of we sort of what, what might look the best from this research versus what's feasible and realistic for them to do. And so we started with this incremental change of now starting this season, they will issue the heat advisories, not when it's forecast to be 100 degrees, uh, but a heat index, but when the heat index is forecast to be 95 degrees. So what does this mean for us, for people out there? What do we need to do? What do we need? What do, how can we be more careful? What do we need to know? Not just me as a news person, yeah. but, but to going out on days where it's warm and it's humid. Right. So the National Weather Service, what they can do is bring you that information, tell you, hey, it's going to be really hot outside. But then it's really up to the individual to change their behavior in a way that minimizes their risk. So what do you want to do? So you definitely want to stay really well hydrated, drink lots of water. You might change your activity patterns. If you like to go jogging, go jogging early in the morning or late at, uh, in the afternoon, late in the evening, rather than in the middle of the day. If you have air conditioning, this might be the time when you use it. And in fact, we know from other research that a lot of people that have air conditioning don't use it yeah. because of the cost. Yeah, for some exactly. people, that's really uh, a problem. And for other people, they just say, well, you know, I, I I never had to use it as a kid, so why would you know I have air conditioning, but I'm not going to use it. And that turns out to not necessarily be the smartest choice. Uh, the elderly, uh, kids, uh, and even you know everybody in between, uh, we see some increased risk in the weekend warriors. You know, the, uh, those of us uh, uh, that might go uh, uh, do extra sports or, or do uh, outdoor activities on the weekends uh, and, and might be spending time with our kids, uh, and then we might also have some of these health effects. So. This isn't, nobody's immune from this. Uh, and we all think, oh yeah, heat is something that's dangerous, but for other people. And uh, here we find that no, in fact, all age groups are uh, vulnerable to, to heat. I, and I found that point of the air conditioning, oh, I didn't need it mm -hmm. before, I don't need it now, that's so interesting. Or you really count in that risk factor for people right. who can't afford it. That's right. Because the energy costs or whatever, I mean, it just, you find that so much. Um, so people are at risk for this and have that mentality, especially you can find that in New England where I don't need it, it's not for me, just that mentality. Right, it and doesn't get hot that often, why would I need yeah. it? Uh, but you know, it turns out it's getting hotter more often in more recent years. We see that the number of days with really high heat has increased dramatically in the last 30 years right here in Rhode Island. And so this is a, a problem that's of growing concern and is going to keep getting uh, of more important concern. And, and continue on that point, uh, do you see that climate change is going to affect this? Do you think this is going to be an ongoing pattern where temperatures are going to continue to climb? Yeah, so the projections for the rest of the century is that we will continue to see uh, uh, average temperatures rise and the number of really hot days is going to increase. And as I said, we've already seen that. So TF Green has a weather station that's been operating since the 70s. And you can we can see that every year we count how many days of really hot days, these days are over 95 degrees. Uh, heat index, and you can see that they've steadily been increasing uh, uh, when we uh, take the average every couple of years, uh, uh, such that we have almost a week more of uh, really high 
uh, heat days now than we did in the 70s. And that's projected to keep increasing through the end of the century. So are, so is it, do you feel like you've made a positive change by putting forward this research and seeing a policy with the National Weather Service being implemented? Do you feel like you've done that? And do you think that moving forward, this is what's going to need to happen? Yeah, I think that this is what needs to happen. And it's a great first step is we need to be able to communicate to the public the risk that they face from these really hot days. Uh, but even more so, we need to then follow that up with positive messages to the public. It's not just, oh, here's a risk, but what can you do about yeah. it? And the notion that it's not just on really hot days that you have these excess risks. So you have uh, also on more moderate risk, you, the, the sort of your individual relative risk, like what percent increase in risk is, is really small, but since so many people are exposed, the total number of uh, extra people that, that have to have an emergency hospital visit or a death is actually pretty big at the more moderate temperatures. Now, we can't have a heat warning every time, yeah. you know, all summer long. Right? We don't want to have all that summer. So we have to start telling people, okay, all summer long, these are the things that you have to do. Uh, it, you know, you just had Scott on from the revolution, so when your kids are playing soccer, you know, if you think uh, you're usually under the shade watching them on, under the tree and they're out there in the full sun playing, and you gotta say, okay, at what point does that actually become a little bit dangerous and should we be careful? And are they drinking enough water uh, when they're subbed out? So these are the kinds of questions and discussions we need to start having, not just among scientists, but with the public, to how can you prevent these heat events all summer long. I like that. So moving forward, we need to continue having these discussions. Absolutely. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Before thank you go, we have to snap a picture. Of course. So we can put that up online.